Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night. And some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. In the Wake of the Dragon's Breath by Scott Donnelly treacherous couldn't even begin to describe the driving conditions. My dad was usually a maestro behind the wheel, making every single trip anywhere as slick and smooth as possible. But as the rain poured down all around us as we traveled the unfamiliar highway at night, something just felt off. From the back seat, I could see his grip on the steering wheel was tighter than normal. My mom in the passenger seat extended her hand to his leg as a comforting gesture. My dad, however, barely reacted to it. He kept both hands gripped around the steering wheel and leaned forward, trying to summon some sort of extra power to pierce the pounding rain against the windshield. The wipers, which were on full blast, didn't seem to be helping. With every swipe up and down that they took, a flood of rain would wash down the glass, voiding out all of the hard work those poor little mechanical appendages were doing. My dad reached over to the center of the dash and pressed a button. The gentle, repetitive clicking sounds of the hazard lights were now the only other sound in the car other than the rain slamming against the aluminum shell that surrounded us. My nerves were on edge, now being tested by the clicking sound, the hard rain, and my mom's increasingly shallow breaths. She was nervous. My dad remained silent, however, holding his gaze forward. Then, out of nowhere, one of our tires must have hit an anomaly in the road. My dad instinctively slammed on the brakes and spun the wheel. The tires screeched against the wet pavement beneath us. I raised my hands and braced them against the roof of the car. My mom screamed, my dad shouted at us, hang on! And then… Everything went silent after that. When I regained my awareness, all I could hear was the rain continuously battering the car. Neither my mom nor my dad were making a sound. I opened my eyes and immediately remembered what had happened. The rain, the tenseness, the car accident. I unbuckled my seatbelt and leaned into the front of the car where my dad and mom sat, slumped over in their seats. Mom? Dad? I cried out, fearing the worst. My voice jostled my mom awake immediately. Her eyes fluttered open and she looked at me. Danny, she quietly said, are you okay? Yes, I said, are you? She nodded and continued to speak softly. I think so. She looked past me and over at my dad in the driver's seat. He was still slumped over, unconscious but breathing. Call for help, she said to me. I fumbled around the front of the car for her phone but couldn't find it. I then searched my dad's side but couldn't find his either. The accident must have tossed everything that was loose around. I checked the floor in the back but couldn't see it. I can't find your phones, I said in a panic. My mom put a gentle, comforting hand on my arm. I looked at her. Try to wave down a car then, she said. It might be our only chance to get some help quickly. I frantically nodded. I turned around and saw my raincoat strewn across the back of the seat. I tossed it on and forced open the damaged back door. I was immediately hit by a thunderous roar of rain and wind. I put the raincoat hood over my head and pushed the door closed to keep the water out of the car and then turned around to see where I was. The only light I had was from our car's headlight, beaming through the rainy night. In their beams I saw trees and bushes but no road. Behind me was a slope that went upward. 
Had we come down it? I turned around and tried my best to see through the falling wall of rain. Then a glint of light in the dark woods caught my eye. As quickly as it caught my attention, it was gone. I squinted, hoping to see it again. And I did, several seconds later. It was a green glow that quickly vanished again. Hello? I called out, but knew no one would be able to hear me in the storm. I started to jog towards the glow, splashing through muddy puddles and moving around trees and overgrown bushes. The closer I got, I realized that the glow wasn't coming and going, but it was static, its appearance only being affected by the vicious swaying of trees and branches in the wind. If there was a light on, someone had to be manning it. I continued on, through the woods, and finally came to the source of the light. I stood before a watchtower of some kind. Standing atop four tall wooden legs was a small, boxy room. In one of the open sides I could see the green glow. It looked like a treehouse or a fort that any kid would love to have in their backyard. Hello! I called up to the room. Anyone there? We were in a car accident and we need help! No one answered my calls. That's when I noticed a ladder was affixed to one of the wooden legs of the watchtower. Maybe they still couldn't hear me over the rain and wind. I decided to climb the ladder, careful not to slip on each of the slick, mossy rungs. When I got to the top, I climbed through an opening on the side and into the tower room. I removed my hood and looked around. To my surprise, there was no one there. There was, however, a small table in the middle of it with an old, antique looking lantern sitting on it. Within the glass of the lantern was a fluttering green flame. Along the wall was a wooden chest, crested by a red and gold steel trim. I walked over to the chest and placed my hands on it. The lock on its front was unlocked. I took notice of a small, green stone shaped like a flame jammed in the center of it. The chest's hinges then creaked as I lifted the lid to look inside. Dust plumed out and I coughed as the particles tried to invade my lungs. Once I shooed away the dust, I reached inside the chest and pulled out a heavy iron shield. It was mostly red and crisscrossed with long, thin silver panels to give it its design. Setting the shield down next to me, I reached into the chest again to see if there was anything else. And there was. Two things, actually. Swords. Both of them identical. Their handles were wrapped in well-worn grips. Their blades, steel from what I could tell, were scratched and chipped along the edges. They'd seen some kind of action at some point. I was no history buff, nor did I pay much attention to this stuff in school, so I couldn't tell which time period they were from. The first thing that came to my young mind were video games, and my favorite kind at that. Action-adventure games that would send you across vast lands of mystery and wonder with nothing but a sword and shield on your back. Survival after that was up to you. I slung the shield over my back and carried the weapons with me as I approached the lantern. There was a knob on the side of it which made the green flame grow bigger. I turned it to the other side which made it shrink, but never actually go out. I turned it back to a neutral position and that's what I noticed at the base of the lantern was a small notch shaped like… was that an upside down raindrop? The fluttering green light caught my eye again, bouncing shadows off the interior of the watchtower. A flame, I thought. It wasn't an upside-down raindrop, it was the outline of a flame. Similar to… I turned around and saw the green flame-shaped emerald in the chest lock. I plucked it out and then lined it up with the notch on the base of the lantern. It would fit perfectly. I wondered what would happen. I wondered what this would unlock. I placed the emerald in the lantern and pushed it all the way. It began to glow as well. The flame inside the lantern then radiated with pulsing bursts of white light, blinding me to the point of me covering my eyes. A sonic burst of energy then threw me backward and I hit the wall of the watchtower. <clears throat> I cringed in pain as I regained my composure. I climbed to my knees and opened my eyes. Everything was different. I was still in the watchtower, but it was no longer nighttime, and it was no longer raining outside. It was daytime. 
The air that flowed in from the watchtower windows was warm. Everything outside sounded calm. I stood to my feet and walked to one of the windows. My eyes must have been deceiving me. No longer was I in the middle of a dark, thunderstorm-throttled forest. I was in a watchtower that loomed over a small, medieval-style village. The homes that I could see were made from stone and wood, the roofs thatched with dry reeds, heather, and straw. A windy dirt path snaked through the village, eventually finding its way through a wooden gate and disappearing over a hill that opened to a vast expanse of fields, mountains, and forests. Music caught my ear. It was calm, soothing. Then I saw someone emerge from one of the dwellings playing a pan flute. Hello! I called down to him. The man stopped playing and looked up at me immediately. His gaze just lingered on me. I guess I hadn't given any thought as to where I was or what had happened. My instincts were still to help my mom and dad back in the car, so when I saw someone I just called out for them. Whether or not that was a good idea or not, I wasn't sure yet. Come down from there, the man said. I turned back and saw the second sword still on the table. I grabbed it and then noticed the green flame emerald that I'd placed in the lantern had shattered like a piece of hard candy all over the table. I carefully descended the ladder on the side of the watchtower, and the man with the pan flute met me underneath it. He looked me up and down, wondering who I was and where I'd come from. I looked at him as well. He looked strange to me. He was a full-grown man, but no taller than I was. He was dressed in plain-colored, loose-fitting clothing. His ears were on the sharper side, and his facial features were just slightly off from the average person's. "'Where did you come from?' he asked. "'The road,' I said. "'We had an accident. My parents are hurt.' "'What road?' the man said. I turned around to show him the direction I had come from, but beyond the wooden fence standing behind me was just an endless sea of rolling hills. I turned back to the man. "'I found the watchtower,' I said. "'I climbed it and found these.' I showed off my weapons and shield. Then I put that emerald in the lantern and ended up here. "'The emeralds brought you here?' the man asked curiously. I nodded. "'Yeah, but it's broken now. It's shattered everywhere.' "'Shattered!' the man exclaimed. "'Oh, that's not good. That's not good at all.' "'What do you mean?' I asked, starting to panic. The man turned around and also started to panic. "'What's going on?' I pleaded. He then turned back to me and looked me dead in the eyes. "'That was the last of the flame emeralds. If it's destroyed, that means there's nothing holding back the darkness now.' Uh, "'Darkness?' I nervously gulped, fearing that I had severely messed something up without even knowing it. "'You've doomed us,' the man said. "'You've doomed all of Miston.' Uh, "'Miston? What's Miston?' The man turned around and presented the vast world to me. "'This is Miston, our world, our home!' In the distance, over the lush, magnificent, and beautiful scenery, black clouds began to form over the mountains and leak across the crystal blue sky, crawling quickly in our direction. Within the spreading black gloom, something swirled within it, revealing only pieces of itself at a time, like a shark exposing its dorsal fin in the ocean. Whatever it was, it was large, black, and scaly. What is it? I trembled. The man just looked on as all of the other villagers slowly and nervously exited their homes to get a look at the encroaching doom. That's Doma, the Black Dragon, the man said, dropping his pan flute to the ground. He is how we all become extinct. Within the black, billowing clouds quickly heading our way, Doma swam through them elegantly, expressing loud roars and sending heavy gusts from its flapping, leathery wings. His head made a brief appearance through the inky blackness. Two yellow eyes glowed in front. A long snout extended downward, lined with rows of sharp teeth. Doma opened his mouth and released a thunderous roar. 
followed by an explosive stream of fire from deep within his core. Even though the dragon was in the distance, I could still feel the heat from its fiery breath as if it were right in front of me. This was not good. Doma, the black dragon, roared maliciously within the unnatural dark clouds unfurling over Miston, the mysterious yet serene world I now found myself in. A scream was caught in my throat, along with a coagulation of nerves and anxiety. I wasn't sure how I ended up here. We'd been in a car accident, that much I was sure of. One minute I was racing through the woods in the stormy night, trying to find help. The next, I was here, in Miston. In my hands were two battle-damaged swords. On my back, a shield. Wrapped around me still was my yellow raincoat. The man who had emerged from his dwelling in the village, the man who had been playfully blowing on a pan flute before he saw me, stood in fear as he watched Doma writhe within the black clouds, spewing roars and steady streams of fire from deep within his throat. Just as the rest of the villagers raced from their homes to get a look at the oncoming hostility in the sky, the man turned and faced me. "'What is your name?' he said, swallowing heavy fear. Uh, Danny, I said. I'm Bolan. Bolan Barspell. I nodded, not sure why he was introducing himself now when the aura around us felt as if everything was about to end anyway. Danny, Bolan said, you were brought to Miston for a reason. You arrived just as Doma has reawakened. I'm not usually a man who puts much of my beliefs in the oracle scriptures of old, but these two events happening simultaneously are impossible to ignore." "'What are the oracle scriptures of old?' I asked, my initial thoughts once again heading toward elements of fantasy books and video games that I'd read and played. "'I have a copy of…' Bolin began, but was interrupted by another villager shouting, "'The Vessos! The Vessos!' There were village-wide gasps and screams. Everyone, including Bolin and myself, looked to the sky. As the black clouds flowed over top of us like an ocean tide, we saw numerous objects shoot down from them, leaving smoky black trails in their wake. The objects crashed down all across Miston, or at least the portion of the world I could see. The mountains, the valley, and then just outside of town there were two objects that slammed into the ground, embedding themselves and lifting the dirt and soil up around them. Vessels, I thought, remembering what the villager had shouted. Vessels for what? They looked more like… eggs. They were large, about the size of a full-grown human. They were mostly black, embraced with glowing green swirls. Then, just like an egg they cracked. The sound was sickening, like bones breaking. The shells of the eggs exploded outward, and emerging from within them were dragons. They were on a much smaller scale than Doma, that much was obvious, but they were still just as menacing in their appearance. They were red and black in color, scaly, and had razor-sharp teeth glistening in their mouths. Strong, leathery wings unfolded from their backs, and long tails unrolled, revealing hooked ends that looked as if they could slice through anything. The two dragons outside the gates of the town roared and then charged us. One ran, one took flight. The villagers screamed and scattered in a panic. They took shelter in their homes, locking their doors. Bolin grabbed me, and we ran as the dragon on foot charged towards us with nothing but animalistic rage billowing from it. It roared, startling me enough to look briefly over my shoulder. That's when I saw it open its mouth and spray a jet of fire at us. I felt the heat immediately. Bolin did too, so he yanked me to the side, pulling me down behind one of the stone homes. The dragon continued past us, its firestorm leading the way and burning the ground ahead of it. What do we do? I panicked. Bolin caught his breath and peered around the side of the stone house. The dragon continued to rush toward another home, one made of wood and a thatched straw roof. It skidded to a stop, took a deep breath, and expelled a fiery blast that engulfed the entire home within seconds. 
A heavy, gusting whoosh from above pulled our attention to the sky. The second dragon flapped its wings like large tarps, searching the ground for targets. Bolin turned to me. Misten will fall! Doma and the dragons will reign! He said. This is all prophesied in the oracle scriptures of old! I just looked at him. There has to be something we can do, I said, not willing to just accept this as the end like he was. The scriptures said that when Doma awakens, he would rain down vessels to incinerate the masses. Anything or anyone left would be devoured by Doma himself, and then the age of the dragons would reign for thousands of centuries. What about me? I asked. What do I have to do with this? You said that Doma and I arriving at the same time was impossible to ignore. What else do the oracle scriptures say? Bolin looked me in the eye and then said softly to himself, It wasn't supposed to be a child. What are you talking about? I asked. Another roar from the soaring dragon above rattled Bolin from his concentration. Then we heard another house go up in flames, followed by screams from the villagers. I have a copy of the Oracle Scriptures in my cellar, Bolin said. If we can get to it before it's burned up, I can read to you what has been foretold about Miston and why you might be so important to us. Well, where's your home? I asked. He motioned in the direction of the watchtower. I peeked around the side of the stone house we hid behind and saw the tower. Beneath the tower, I saw the small home where I had initially seen Bolin emerge from playing his pan flute. So far, it had been untouched by the dragons. Well, I said, holding up both of the battle-damaged swords in my hands, I have weapons. I handed one to Bolin, and he accepted it. Let's go. Bolin nodded and gripped the sword as if he had done so in the past. I sensed he may have had either a history with the swords or just battles in general. I didn't know what Miston had seen before I arrived, but like with any world or land, battles and wars were an unfortunate commonplace. We both crouched down and I followed his lead. When the coast was clear, we made our move. He rushed out from behind the stone house, but immediately our luck ran out. The grounded dragon snapped its head toward us, away from the pile of cinder it was creating out of another home. It roared and then hissed, charging us with ferocious speed. Bolin stopped and held up his sword. His battle stance confirmed to me that he had seen action in the past. Get to my house, Bolin commanded. In the cellar, in the chest, read the oracle scriptures of old. If you're truly the foretold hero of Miston, then you'll know what to do. But what if I go now? Bolin shouted as the dragon charged him with loud shrieks and roars. As it approached him, it spun around and swung its tail, but Bolin ducked and dodged its fiercely sharp hook. Bolin stood to his feet and swung his sword back, connecting with the dragon's side. It shrieked in pain and then slashed at Bolin with one of its claws. Bolin bounced backward, dodging the attack. I realized Bolin knew what he was doing, so I decided to just get to his house as quickly as I could and just hope that he made it there as well once his sparring match was over. I heard the clang of his sword against the scaly hide of the dragon as I raced toward his house. There was nothing in my way, as long as I could get inside without… The airborne dragon dropped hard to the ground between myself and Bolin's house. Dirt and rocks swirled up around it like a dust storm as it lowered its head. Its cursed yellow eyes glared at me. Its lips quivered and then it expelled a loud and predatory roar. I stopped where I was, but only for the briefest moment did I feel fear. I thought about how Bolin was facing off against one of these beasts as well. I remembered how he said I might be the hero of Miston. And I liked that title. I wanted to be the hero of Miston. I'd never been a hero before. I held my sword out in front of me and pulled the shield off my back. I held it up and smirked at the dragon. Come and get it, lizard brain, I quipped. The dragon must have not liked my quip. It hissed and then spewed flames directly at me. I ducked and placed the shield in front of my body. 
I felt the flames pound against the front of the shield like a pressure washer. When they subsided, I stood up and saw the dragon switch gears. It charged me on foot. I rolled out of the way just as the dragon slammed a claw down at me. It hit the dirt, sending a tremor my way and shaking me off balance. I fell to my back on the ground, leaving myself exposed. The dragon then appeared over top of me. I looked up, seeing nothing but the underside of its belly first. Then it lowered its head again. It snarled, its breath as hot as an oven leaked over me. One blast of fire and I was a goner. But as exposed as I was, so was he. Thinking quickly before he had the chance, I thrust my sword upward and into the underbelly of the beast. It recoiled, shrieked, and backed off, spinning around in agonizing pain. I stood up just as its hooked tail came swinging at me. I lifted my sword and hacked at it, lopping off the hooked portion. It flopped to the ground and wriggled for a moment before falling still. The dragon howled and tried to take flight again, but its injuries had hindered its dexterity. It wobbled to the side and collided with one of the homes it had previously set aflame. The dragon was engulfed in its own destruction. It went up in flames with the house, eventually disappearing within the fiery display. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. A hand touched my shoulder and I jumped. It's just me, Bolin said. His face and body were covered by scrapes and cuts, but he was alive. Twenty yards or so behind him, the other dragon lay slain. Come, Bolin said, leading me to his home. Above Mistan, Doma stirred restlessly, agitated and enraged. The inside of Bolin's home stunk of smoke, no doubt from the collective onslaught of the attack on the village. His home was dimly lit by lanterns and candlelight, mostly trusting the natural light from outside for daily comfort. But with the dark, undulating clouds that had spread across the sky, that natural light was all but gone now. Bolin crossed the length of his home and arrived at a door that looked to be made of a soft, swollen wood. He turned to me and tossed the sword that he still possessed to me. I caught it with ease, surprising myself, but not Bolin. He smirked, like he expected me to easily catch the sharp flying weapon. Could I have actually been the prophesied hero of Miston he spoke of? Bolin pulled the door open and revealed a dark staircase that descended beneath the ground. Follow me, he said. I did as he told me and followed him into the dark, damp cellar beneath his house, while above, the angry, black dragon Doma released a vicious roar that shook every single loose object in Bolin's home. In the cellar, Bolin ignited a torch. The bright flame lit up most of the room. The floor was a layer of dirt, wet in some places, and along each wall were shelves crudely built into the dirt. He went directly to a shelf that contained several books. He pulled one off in particular and blew a thin coating of dust off of it. Bolin handed me the book. The Oracle Scriptures by Lady Walda Naywell, I read the title and its author aloud. Page 276, Bolin said. I sat my swords down and flipped to page 276. It was a chapter called The Oracle Scriptures of Old. Read. Bolin said. I placed my finger on the first word and read the first paragraph out loud. Through harsh winds to brave the fires of Mistin, a hero will arrive unannounced. His presence shall look grim at first, bringing rise to Doma, the black dragon, but soon will prove to be the brilliance. Using the weapons of his senior, he shall be armed enough to save Mistin in the wake of the dragon's breath. I furrowed my brow at the paragraph. Sure, it sounded like what was going on, but there was no way this was what was happening. I wasn't whisked away from my life in a ball of light or anything and ended up here. We were in a car crash. I left to get help. That's when I stumbled on this place. I thought back to the watchtower and the green flame of the lantern. I thought about the chest with the swords and the green emerald. 
When I placed it in the lantern, it shattered and then everything went bright. Wait a second, I thought. Am I dead? Bolin just cocked his head. That's your response to reading the prophecy? There was a loud rumble and thunderous roar from above that now shook everything in the cellar, including Bolin and myself. We shifted off balance, but Bolin caught himself on me, placing one hand on my arm. Don't question who you are, he said. You're a hero, Danny. You have to trust and believe that. With his torch, he pointed up, following the licking flames with his gaze. Doma sounds angry. We don't have much time. Mishton doesn't have much time. Bolin returned his gaze to me, hopeful and desperate. How had I gotten myself into this? As Doma released another horrifying scream from above, a knot twisted in my stomach. But not because of the dragon and the devastation it had been raining down on Miston. It was because of my parents. They were still stuck in the car, trapped. It had been up to me to go out and look for help. When I ended up here, I failed them. I was fighting someone else's battle when I needed to be fighting for my parents. Something caught my eye at the top of the dark staircase. It was gone as quickly as it happened, but I was certain as to what I saw. A small, green, flickering flame. It immediately reminded me of a way home. I looked back to Bolin, a sense of hope now in my eyes. I swallowed hard and breathed deeply. Stay here, I told him. You'll be safe. Bolin nodded and slunk back into the corner of the cellar. I tossed the book down on an old rickety table, grabbed my swords, and raced back up the staircase. A new sense of energy swelling within me. I closed the door behind me, sealing Bolin off from the horrors that were undoubtedly about to unfold outside, and then left his home. Outside, the air had grown cold due to the thick layer of black clouds that loomed overhead. I could see Doma's body writhing within them, his tail occasionally slicing through, and parts of the blackness lighting up from the fiery breaths he was expelling. I looked over to the smoldering house where the dragon I had killed crash-landed. Most of the fire had subsided at this point, leaving the house to just spew thick, black smoke into the air. The dragon's body, ironically, charred beyond recognition, laying half in and half out of the smoky dwelling. I needed to find a way to get Doma's attention, and since he didn't seem to like when Bolin and I killed his little scaly messengers of death, I figured I'd go over and tarnish the body some more. I spun my swords in my hands like a professional and stormed over to the smoking home. I raised both swords over my head and slammed them down into the dragon's well-done body like I was the one about to carve the Thanksgiving turkey. A loud roar erupted, reverberating through the ground and up the blades of the swords. My hands rattled violently and I released my grip on them. I looked up to the sky and just as I had hoped, I had poked the bear. Doma thrashed around, slashing its claws and whipping its hooked tail. He roared and blew a white, hot stream of fire through the clouds. I almost had him. I needed one more nail in the coffin. I looked at the charred remains of the infantry dragon, and then, with as much force as I could muster, I delivered a kick to its hindquarters like I was punting a football. That did it. Doma finally revealed himself in full. The dragon was massive, putting Godzilla to shame. It fell from the clouds and opened its wings, sending hurricane-force gusts of wind across Miston. I did all I could to keep from being knocked down or blown away. I grabbed the hilts of the swords and ripped them out of the overcooked dragon. I held them up in front of me as Doma soared through the air and in my direction. Within the steel blade of one of the swords, a glinting green light caught my eye. It was reflecting from something behind me. I turned around and didn't see anything. There was no green light anywhere. However, the watchtower did loom not that far away. Maybe the lantern had been trying to work again? I was rushed by Doma. He flew over top of me, actually knocking me off my feet this time. I'd been too distracted by the green light. When I stood up, I held the swords tightly and grit my teeth. I faced Doma as he turned around in the sky and flew back toward me. I held the swords out in front of me again, not exactly sure what I was going to do. Doma roared. My legs were shaking. As it flew over me, I jumped and tried slashing at it over and over. 
but I missed every single time. That's when Doma's tail, wriggling like a devilish snake, snapped like a whip and knocked both swords from my hands. They flew several yards away and shattered upon a rock. My eyes widened and a hollow breath escaped me. Oh no, I trembled. Doma turned around again and made a third pass at me. This time he opened his mouth. His teeth glistened. Deep within his throat, before the bulb of white hot flames began to conjure, I saw the small green flame flicker again. Something told me the green flame was trying to communicate with me, trying to guide me. But guide me into the dragon's mouth? I wasn't so sure about that. As the ball of white hot fire swelled within the blackness of Doma's throat, it reached maximum power and exploded outward. Thinking quickly, I removed the shield from my back and placed it in front of me, kneeling down behind it to completely conceal myself. The flames pounded the other side with enough force to push me backward. When the fiery thrashing had ended, I stood up and awaited Doma's next pass. I looked around frantically for anything I could use as a weapon. The only thing within reach was the hooked end of the dragon's tail that I had severed earlier. I remember thinking how it had the appearance of being so sharp that it could have been capable of cutting through anything. Out of options, I picked it up and wielded it as my new weapon. I grit my teeth and held my ground as Doma flew back at me. He roared, unhinged his jaw, and that's when I closed my eyes. I swung the hooked tail, but felt it only slice through air. Then I was plowed into by Doma's jaw. I stumbled forward, losing my grip on the shield and falling face first onto his sticky, hot tongue. The walls of his mouth all tensed and flexed at once and within seconds, I was pulled back further within him and finally swallowed. I opened my eyes a moment later to darkness. My surroundings were gross and wet, it smelled musty and sour. Everything sloshed around me. I heard echoes of screaming and hurried voices. I still gripped the hooked tail in my hand, so I was prepared for anything. Suddenly materializing ahead of me was the small green flame. It flickered just ahead, giving me enough light to take in my surroundings. I was in danger. I was in the belly of the beast. Next to me were two other bodies, a man and a woman, floating in the murky contents of Doma's stomach. Even though they were face down, something told me they were alive. Are you guys okay? I called out to them, my voice echoing in Doma's stomach chamber. I swam over to them and shook their bodies. Stay with me! I called out. I'll help you get out of here! With the hooked edge of the tail in my hand, I held my breath and dove into the murky sludge, feeling my way to the bottom. When I finally felt its slimy, soft surface, I stabbed the hooked dragon's tail into it and sliced as hard as I could. The dragon's belly opened up, spilling out all of its contents, including me. I kept my eyes closed tightly, trying to avoid the sludgy mess getting into them. When my body hit the ground, I felt the watery contents still continue to fall on me, pittering and pattering on my face and body. I felt myself submerged in the murky remains of the dragon. I heard voices. He's here, one of them said. The boy is here. Was that Bolin? I chose to keep my eyes closed, not ready to see what I had done to the dragon or what mess was surrounding me. Then a green light shined on me. I could see it pulse through my eyelids. The man and woman are alive, another voice echoed not that far away. Man and woman? The ones who were floating in the dragon's stomach? I opened my eyes to see a small green light shining in my face. I swiped at it, connecting with someone holding a flashlight with a greenish tint. It was a man, wearing a fireman's jacket and hat. Rain poured down over him and dripped onto me. I squinted, and the fireman smiled. "'You're going to be okay,' he said. "'Your parents are okay, too.' "'My parents?' I groggily asked him grabbing at my head to try and suppress a splitting headache. He helped me sit up and I looked around. I was laying in the mud, surrounded by trees. There were flashing lights in the distance, red and blue. They were emergency lights. The accident, I thought. Did you try to go for help, little man? The fireman said, helping me to my feet. That's pretty heroic, he said with a gentle pat on my back. 
The firemen helped me trudge through the mud and through the trees. I glanced back, wondering about the green flame and the watchtower in the woods. A couple of hours later, while in the hospital, I had the full story. We had wrecked, obviously. I suffered a concussion, which caused me to lose consciousness in the woods when I went for help. Someone had seen our vehicle go off the road and called 911. I wasn't out there too long before the rescue workers arrived. My parents, who also suffered some minor injuries and concussions, came to visit me in my recovery room. My dad's head was bandaged up and my mom's arm was held tightly across her midsection in a dark blue sling. "'Are you okay, Danny?' my mom asked. I nodded with a smile. "'You went for help,' she said, a proud look on her face. "'A real hero,' my dad added with a quick squeeze to my leg. I smiled. "'I passed out in the woods, though,' I said. "'Not sure I succeeded.' "'You took the initiative,' my mom said. "'You braved the rain, the wind, the dark, the dragon,' I jokingly added. My mom cocked her head. "'Huh? <laughs> Nothing,' I said, passing it all off as a joke. Now I realized everything I had experienced in Miston was just an unconscious dream I'd had. My dad looked concerned. He put a hand on my mom's shoulder. "'Can you go get the doctor?' he asked her. My mom, assuming my dad was worried about something, maybe the fact that I had just mentioned a dragon, didn't hesitate. She left to fetch a doctor immediately. My dad sat on the edge of my hospital bed. "'Are you okay?' he asked. I nodded. "'I was just joking about the dragon, Dad. I don't need—' "'No,' he said. "'You weren't. You were there. You were in Miston. I wondered that the moment the paramedics said you were unconscious out in the woods.' I didn't know what to say. I just looked at him. He smiled. I've been there myself, he said, when I was your age. I'd fallen from a tree I was climbing. I blacked out for not even a full minute, but I was in Miston for hours, helping a small village fight against the Skull Lord. My dad leaned in closer. A dragon, you say? I nodded. Doma, the Black Dragon. They said I was the hero of Miston? I was there to defeat Doma and bring peace to Miston. My dad smirked. You won. I nodded. I think so. I woke up just as I delivered the final slice. He smiled again and tussled my hair. You wouldn't have been able to leave until you won, he said. You won, he indicated. Miston is safe again. As I lay there, taking in everything my dad was saying, I thought back to a specific line in the oracle scriptures of old. Using the weapons of his senior, he shall be armed enough to save Miston in the wake of the dragon's breath. The weapons of my senior. The weapons of my dad. For some reason, Danny, the men in our family have been tasked with protecting a land known as Miston, my dad said. You did it. I did it. Your grandfather even had quite the adventure there. And one day, because of some unforeseen accident your son may suffer, he'll be called upon as well." It was then that my mom came back into the room with a doctor. My dad put his finger to his lips, ordering the existence of Miston to secrecy. I obliged. Miston would remain as only a memory for myself, a shared treasure between my father and I, until one day, when my own son, will confide his unconscious adventure in me. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, visit our website at microterrors.com where we will also have spooky games you can print out and play, like wicked word searches, mysterious mazes, and more. Microterrors.com is also where you can find us on your favorite social media and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you'll learn more about our author, Scott Donnelly, who has other horrors for both young and old. I hope you'll join me again soon for Micro Terrors. 
Scary Stories for Kids Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.